My father looked at Mr. Snoddy's car and I always took his repair bills with me to school to save postage. One day during break, I went to Mr. Snoddy's study to give him a bill and Sidney Morgan came along with me. He didn't come for any special reason. We just happened to be together at the same time. And as we went in, we saw Mr. Snoddy standing at his desk refilling his famous glass of water from a bottled blade labeled Gordon's Gin. He jumped a mile when he saw us. You, you should have knocked, he said, sliding the bottle behind a pile of books. Oh, I'm sorry, sir, I said. I brought my father's bill. Ah, he said. Very well. And what do you want, Sidney? Uh, nothing, sir, Sidney Morgan said. Nothing at all. Off you go, the, both of you, Mr. Snoddy said, keeping his hand on the bottle behind the books. Run along. Outside in the car, we made a pact that we wouldn't tell any other children about what we had seen. Mr. Snoddy had always been kind to us, and we wanted to repay him by keeping his deep, dark secret to ourselves. The only person I told my was my father, and when he heard it, he said, I don't blame him one bit. If I was unlucky enough to be married to Mrs. Snoddy, I would drink something a little bit stronger than gin. What would you drink, Dad? Poison, he said. She's a frightful woman. She is frightful. Why is she frightful, I asked. She's sort of a witch, he said, and to prove it, she has seven toes on each foot. Well, how do you know that, I asked. Doc Spencer told me, my father answered. And then, to change the subject, he said, why don't you ever ask Sidney Morgan over here to play? Ever since I started going to school, my father had tried to encourage me to bring fr my friends back to the spilling station for tea or supper. And every year, about a week before my birthday, he would say, let's have a party this time, Danny. We can write our invitations and, and I'll go into the village and buy chocolate eclairs and donuts. We can write our invitations and I'll go to the village and buy chocolate eclairs and donuts. Uh, but I always had said no to the suggestions and I never invited any other children to come to my home after school or at weekends. That wasn't because I didn't have good friends, I had lots of them. Some of them were super kids, especially Sid Sidney Morgan. Perhaps if I lived in the same street as some of them instead of where in the country, things would have been very different. But then again, perhaps they wouldn't. You see, the real reason I don't want anyone to come back and play with me is because I had such a good time to be alone with my father. On, by the way, something horrible happened on Thursday morning after my father had left me at the school gate and gone to off to buy the raisins. We were having our first lesson of the day with Captain Lancaster and he he had set us a whole bunch of multiplication sums to do in our exercise books. I was sitting next to Sidney Morgan in the back row and we were both slogging away. Captain Lancaster sat up at the front desk gazing suspiciously around the class with his watery blue eyes and even from the back row I could hear him snorting and snuffling through his nose like a dog outside a rabbit hole. Sidney Morgan covered his mouth with his hand and whispered very soft to me, what are eight nines? Seventy-two, I whispered back. Captain Lancaster's finger shot out like a bullet and pointed straight at my face. You, he shouted, stand up. Uh, me, sir, I said. Yes, you blithering little idiot. I stood up. You were talking, he barked. What were you saying? He was shouting at me as if I was a platoon of soldiers on a parade ground. Come on, boy, out with it. I stood still and said nothing. Are you refusing to answer me, he shouted. Uh, please, sir, Sidney said it was my fault. I asked him a question. Oh, you did, did you? Stand up. Sidney stood up beside me. And what exactly did you ask him, Captain Lancaster said, speaking more quietly now and far more dangerously. I asked him what eight nines. Sidney said, and I, suppose, and I suppose you answered him, Captain Lancaster said, pointing at me. He never called any of us by our names. It was always you or boy or girl or something like that. Did you answer him or didn't you? Speak up, boy. Uh, yes, sir, I did. So you were cheating, he said. Both of you were cheating. We kept silent. Cheating is a repulsive habit practiced by gutter snipes and dandy prats, he said. From where I was standing, I could see the whole class sitting absolutely rigid watching Captain Lancaster. Nobody dared move. You may be permitted to cheat and lie and swindle in your own homes, he went on, but I will not put up with it here. At that point, a sort of blind fury took hold of me and I shouted back and I am not a cheat. There was a fearful silence in the room. Captain Lancaster raised his chin and fixed me with one watery eye. You are not only cheating, but you are insolent, he said quietly. You are a very insolent boy. Come up here, both of you, come up here. As I stepped from our desk and we began walking up towards the front of the class, I knew exactly what was going to happen. I'd seen it happen to others many times to both boys and girls, but up until now, it would never happen to me. Each time I'd seen it, I had been made to feel quite
white sick inside. Captain Lancaster was standing up, crossing over to the tall bookcase and stood against the left-hand wall of the classroom. He reached up to the topmost shelf of the bookcase and brought down the dreaded cane. It was a white, it was white, this cane was as white as a bone, and very long and very thin, and with one end bent over into a handle like a walking stick. You first, he said, pointing at me with a cane, hold out your left hand. It was almost impossible to believe that this man was about to injure me physically and in cold blood as I lifted my left palm towards upwards and held it there. I looked at the palm itself and the pink skin and the fortress tellus lines running over it and I still could not bring myself to imagine that anything was going to happen to it. The long white cane came down, it went up high in the air and came down in my hand with a crack like a rifle going off. I heard the crack first. About two seconds later, I felt the pain. Never had I felt a pain such as that in my whole life. It was as if, as though someone were pressing a red hot poker against my palm and holding it there. I remember grabbing my injured left hand with my right hand and ramming it between my legs and squeezing my legs together against it. I squeezed and squeezed as hard as I could as if I was trying to stop the hand from falling to pieces. I managed not to cry out loud, but I couldn't keep the tears from pouring down my cheeks. From somewhere nearby, I heard another fearful swish crack. I knew that was poor Sydney had just got it as well. But oh, that fearful searing burning pain crossed my hand. Why didn't it go away? I glanced at Sydney. He was doing just the same as me, squeezing his hand between his legs and making the most awful face. Go and sit down, both of you, Captain Lancaster ordered. We stumbled back to our desk and sat down. Now, get on with your work, the dreaded voice said. And let us have no more cheating, no more insolence either. The class bent their heads over their books like people in church saying their prayers. I looked at my hand. There was a long, ugly mark about half an inch wide running across the palm, just where the fingers joined the hand. It was raised up in the middle, and the raised part was pure white with red on both sides. I moved my fingers. They moved, they moved all right, but it hurt to move them. I looked at Sidney. He gave me a quick, apologetic glance under his eyelids, then went back to his sons. When I got from home from school that afternoon, my father was in the workshop. I bought the raisins, he said. We'll put them out to soak. Fetch me a bowl of water, Danny. I, bent over to the, over, I went over to the caravan and got a bowl and half filled it with water. I carried it up to the workshop and put it on the bench. Open up the packets and tip them all in, my father said. This was one of the really nice things about my father. He didn't take over it and just want to do everything himself. Whether it was a difficult job like adjusting a carburetor or a big engine, or that was a simple tip tipping some raisins in the basin. He always let me go ahead and do it myself while he watched and stood ready to help. He was watching me now as I opened the first packet of raisins. Hey, he cried, grabbing his left, my left wrist. What's happened to your hand? Oh, it is nothing, I said, clenching the fist. He made me open it up. A long scarlet mark lay across the palm like a burn. Who did it, he shouted. Was it Captain Lancaster? Yes, Dad, but it's nothing. What happened? He was gripping the wrist so hard it almost hurt. Tell me exactly what happened. I told him everything. He stood there holding his wrist, my wrist, his face growing whiter and whiter. I could see the fury beginning to boil up dangerously inside him. I'll kill him, he softly whispered when I had finished. I swear I'll kill him. His eyes were blazing and all the colour had gone from his face. I had never seen him look like that before. But I'll forget it, Dad. I will not forget it, he said. You did nothing wrong. And he had absolutely no right to do this to you. So. He called you a cheat, did he? I nodded. He had taken his jacket from the peg of the wall and was putting on. Oh, where are you going? I asked. I'm going straight to Captain Lancaster's house and I'm going to beat the living daylights out of him. No, 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 I cried, hold, and held onto his arm. Don't do it, Dad, please. I won't do, it won't do any good. Please don't do it. I've got to, he said. No, I cried, tugging his arm. I'll be ruin everything. It'll only make it worse. Please forget it. He hesitated. Then I held on to his arm. He was silent, and I could see the rush of anger slowly draining out of his face. It's revolting, he said. I bet they did it to you when you were at school, I said. Of course they did. And I bet your dad didn't do go rushing off to beat the day. That's out of the day teacher, did he? He looked at me, but he kept quiet. He didn't, did he, Dad? No, Danny, he didn't, he answered softly. I let go of his arm and helped him off with his jacket and hung it back on the peg. I'm going to put the raisins in now, I said. And don't forget that tomorrow I have a nasty cold and I'm going to be going to school. Yes, he said, that's right. We've got 200 raisins to fill. I said, ah, he said, we have. I hope you'll get done in time. We're getting done in time. I said, but it doesn't hurt, he asked. 
that hand? No, I said, not one bit. I think that satisfied him. And although I saw him glancing occasionally at my palm during the rest of the afternoon and evening, he never mentioned the subject again. That night, he didn't tell me a story. He sat on the edge of my bunk and we talked about what was going to happen the next day up in Hazel's Wood. He got me so steamed up and excited about it. I couldn't get to, to sleep. I think we must have got him steamed up almost as much because after he had undressed and climbed into the bunk, I heard him twisting and turning all over the place. He couldn't get to sleep either. At about 10.30, he climbed out of his bunk, put on the kettle. What's the matter, Dad? Uh, nothing, he said. Shall we have a midnight feast? Yeah, let's do that. He lit the lamp on the ceiling, opened a tin of tuna and made a delicious sandwich for each of us. Also hot chocolate for me and tea for him. Then he started talking about the pheasants and about Hazel's wood all over again. It was pretty late before we got to sleep. That's the end of chapter 12. Great chapter.